the first two years of your life, you, you, you learn more than you learn the rest of your life. Brett Wigdortz, OBE, is an educational disruptor having founded Teach First and now Tiny, accessible childcare solutions for parents and childminders. Brett is here to show you how to transform childcare and teaching. Children aren't these empty vessels. I thought our secondary schools are where you make the biggest impact in your know, teenagers. I actually realize now it's primary schools have a much bigger impact in the lives of children than secondary schools. My whole career focus has been on ensuring all children get access to an outstanding education. It's a sector where you need a lot of adults and there's not a lot of money. The nurseries only pay uh, minimum wage, sometimes less than minimum wage. Earlier is education is a proper professional skill. So you guys can be leaders helping children to a better future. It sometimes takes a new initiative or a spark or a new tech to change people's way of working. That's what I'm hoping we can do with child money. What do you think Tiny does better than anyone to create that kind of space for childminders? I mean, what I think we do really well Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostrovsky. As you know, I'm tinkering away to bring Anatomy of a Leader live in a London location. So if you'd like to be the first to know when Anatomy of a Leader goes live, then click the link in the show notes to be added to the waitlist. This week, I speak with Brett Wigdort, who after founding his successful educational charity, Teach First, realized that to make the most impact, education needs to start much earlier in a child's life. We talk about Teach First, and Tiny, his latest startup, and why we need to see child mining as a genuine profession that needs to be compensated well. What I admire most about Brett is how passionate, driven, and committed he is to making a difference in all children's lives. So without further ado, here is Brett Wigdortz. Brett, <laughs> welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thanks for having me. So nice to have you here. And uh, I know it's taken us a while to sit down and talk properly. So, you know, thank you for being patient. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thanks for, thanks for having me in this rainy day. Yeah, wonderful English. Yeah. I... Well, Brett, for those people who don't know you, can you give like a two minute introduction, who you are and what you're doing with your business? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say my whole career focus has been on ensuring all children get access to an outstanding education. That's what I get very passionate about, that every child out there has great ability. But we still live in a society, both in the UK and globally, where many children uh, don't get access to the education they need to make the most out of what they're capable of. And I think that's a huge, huge crime. Um, so I was a management, I'm originally from America. I was a management consultant for a while. I started this charity, Teach First, in 2002. And the whole idea of Teach First was to get additional outstanding teachers into low-income schools and build a whole leadership cohort around this mission of ensuring all children have access to an outstanding education. Um, I ran that for 15 years and grew it to be the largest graduate recruiter in the UK. So I think we've now recruited about 20,000 teachers in England and a whole wonderful group of entrepreneurial um, organizations have flown from that, whether you know uh, things helping social work, things helping uh, policing, things helping um, all sorts of other educational areas. Lots of head teachers. There's been a lot that has come from that. Uh, I co-found this thing, Teach for All, which is this global network. And I spent a lot of time now in about like 30 or 40 countries around the world helping get similar models in places like India, um, Germany, Australia, Chile, Lebanon, Israel, um, all, over the, all over the world, um, which has been really exciting to build these cohorts of amazing leaders who are really focused on the needs of low-income kids. Um, and then about five years ago, um, I uh, founded Tiny, and that's what I'm working on now. Tiny really led from this whole idea I saw over the last 20 years, that if you want to help children get access to a great education, you have to start as early as possible. And, How early? Um, well, I mean, you could say from the moment they're born, yeah. or even before they're born, I think some people would say. Um, like listening to, like playing Mozart to the pregnant belly and... Um, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, and I think there's so much of it, you know, brain synapses and learning happen so young. I mean, more and more, there's more and more evidence uh, over the last 20 years that shows, you know, actually, it's never too young, actually, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, children are these empty vessels, they're actually, they're learning at a very young age. Um, and it is really important for children to get access to a great earlier education setting. I, I visit a lot of low income primary schools around the country. And you could see the kids in year one and two and three who didn't have access to that setting when they were younger. And they really struggle in school, in primary school. And that then goes into secondary school and, and adulthood. And, um, you know, if, if policy was made in a logical manner, 
more money would be spent on early years than on secondary schools because mm-hmm. actually early years is even more important, you know, to get right. Mm-hmm. And I think very few countries really see that for all sorts of reasons. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, what is the biggest barrier to children getting that early, you know, early years education? Like, wh- why do some not get it at all? Yeah. Well, I think one major barrier is there's not enough great educators in that sector. Mm-hmm. So. Every country in the world, almost, especially England, but many countries have this problem, is we need more great early years educators. Like there's just a shortage of people. So obviously there's an amazing groups of people in there who are amazing nursery workers and child minders and, you know, early years educators, but we need a lot more, we, you know, and there's a massive shortage of them. It's often the parents from wealthier backgrounds who get access to good early years mm-hmm. care for their kids while the children who actually probably need it the most struggle to get that. And that's mm. true, you know, globally. So is it to do with cost as well? I think cost is a big issue. So, um, and this is what led me to tiny and child binding is, is the idea that to get really good educators focused on early years, you need to be able to pay them a professional salary. And I think it's criminal that for the most part, nurseries only pay um, minimum wage, sometimes less than minimum wage because they use apprenticeship, some sorts of things. Um, and you obviously can't get educators on that sort of salary. I mean, early years educators should make at least as much as a, a secondary school teacher. There's no logical reason they should make less than a secondary school teacher. Because you need one educator for only a few kids, because of the ratios, you need a lot of adults. So unlike in secondary school, where one adult can work with 30 kids, obviously you can't work with 32-year-olds. You need one adult for every you know, three two-year-olds, maybe. So you need a lot of adults. So you need to figure out a way to pay these adults a good salary. And I think that's always the struggle for nurseries and many settings because they have all these overheads and they have buildings and everything else to pay for. And then it's really difficult to pay um, the professionals what they're worth, basically, mm. which, which is a real struggle. So this is a question. I mean, whose responsibility is it? I mean, talking about that, you know, the people who need it most can't afford it. Um, and then, you know, where a lot of energies are being spent is when they're already, you know, a little bit older. So there's this big, big gap. So who should be responsible? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting, like why in early years, you know, I mean, it's changed a little bit now in the last year where government's starting to give um, money, you know, uh, entitlements to parents for certain days and certain parents um, for early years care. But you have to ask, why does education really start at four? Why, why doesn't this government requirement, you know, a re- not requirement, but government support start even younger and younger mm-hmm. because we know how important it is. Um, and I think it's probably historic reasons. I think it's a combination, I think, of a bit of sexism. Like you just think this is the mom's responsibility in the past. And, you know, um, also I think it's a bit of not really understanding brain development as much as we do now, where in the past people would just think, okay, let these little kids just do whatever they want, you know? Mm-hmm. And now we actually understand, like, if they need to get a really good professional um, experience. You need uh, a good early years setting and everything really to get those brain synapses moving correctly mm-hmm. and to actually learn what they need to in order to be really um, developed like the way that you want them to develop as young kids. So I think actually it's been a real shift in knowledge and you know policy hasn't necessarily caught up. Mm. Going back to you know why you were so interested in the whole education space in the first place, where did that come from for you? Well, my mom's a teacher and my brother's a teacher and um, almost all my aunts and uncles and cousins are teachers. I basically come from a whole family of teachers. Um, There's a lot of role models. A lot of role models. Mm-hmm. And I think where it came to me, when I was working as a management consultant, I got on a project looking at how businesses could help education in London. And in 2002, uh, schools in London were, were not very good. And in England, I'd say. Um, I think for all the problems people talk about in the country and all these public policy issues, I do think education has gotten a lot better in the last 20 years. And sometimes we don't celebrate it that, you know, England now does have a pretty good education system globally. And London especially is one of the top ranked big cities in the world, actually, Mm -hmm. for education. Um, And that's been a total change. But I think 20 years ago or 22 years ago, I would visit a number of schools in London and it was just shocking how bad they were, um, how many schools where kids were just kind of being housed, it felt like there was no purpose for it. There was no, um, there was no, like the educators there didn't really have goals for the kid. Like they were just sort Mm -hmm. of trying to keep them off the street. Mm -hmm. And you thought, okay, these were kids who have amazing potential. They could do so much, but they're being let down by the system. Mm -hmm. And that really struck me as like this real tragedy. And I think basically a civil rights issue that, you know, you have a whole groups of children who are being let down and then into adulthood. 
Um, and that got me interested in starting Teach First and thinking there is a solution about this. We know companies and organizations attract great people. Mm -hmm. Why can't these schools attract enough great people? I mean, they're attracting some, but how can they attract even more great people? And um, I think that just got me excited about solving that issue. Mm. What's the biggest thing that you've learned with Teach First? Um, God, I think a few things. I think, um, I think I'll, I'll say two. Um, one I've learned is people want to help and uh, do the right thing um, if you give them an opportunity. I think that's something hugely optimistic, especially young people. So when we started Teach First, uh, there were very, very few top graduates teaching in low-income state schools. I remember talking to the head of careers at Oxford who said I think there were three or four that year. Um, so, and everyone, I remember so many people said, look, these graduates have so many other opportunities in life. Um, you know, they could join PwC, they could do this, that, and the other, Goldman Sachs, whatever. They're not really going to want to do that. And I think if you set up the scheme in the right way and give them an opportunity to help others, and at Teach First, we didn't pay them more. You know, the main thing was it was a mission-focused organization. But we did say, look, you guys can be leaders helping children to a better future. I think that attracts a lot of people. And there's a lot of people who want that opportunity in their life. So that's mm -hmm. the one thing that makes me very optimistic. Um, I think the other thing I learned from Teach First was the importance of scale and impact. I think a lot of charities uh, stay small and they shouldn't. And, um, you know, I think, you know, maybe charities and maybe many organizations really need to be honest with themselves. Like if they want to solve a problem, they need to get all over. And I, I always use the example, it took us um, 12 years to get to Grimsby as one area of the country. And uh, whenever I would talk about it with board members or others, they would say, oh, go to London first or Birmingham or go easier places. And it took forever until we started placing teachers in Grimsby, which was really complicated. And I remember when I went to Grimsby, meeting some six formers there and explaining what Teach First was. And one of the six formers said to me, um, well, this is great, but how long have you been going? And I said, well, we've been 12 years in London. And he just said, like, well, why have you been in London 12 years and you haven't been in Grimsby? Don't we need great teachers in Grimsby? And I think that's true for many organizations or charities. They always look at those sort of places last. And so I think often, you know, you have to get to a scale and you need to focus on, you know, where the people need you the most as, as opposed to where is it easiest to get to. Mm. One of the key things I think for charities is also balancing this need of like having a purpose, but also having the cash behind you. Mm. And, you know, it, it still needs to be run as a business because, you know, you need to attract amazing talent. You need to be able to pay people. What are your thoughts on that? Or, you know, how did you ch tackle that challenge? Yeah, I think, I mean, in some ways it's even more difficult for a charity because in business, I'm now, now tiny is a business. Mm -hmm. And in some ways businesses are easier because you're trying to get to profitability and, you know, it's money, it's a bit easier. I mean, we're- It's like everybody expects it to be that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's a mission focused business, but it's easier to set goals. I think charity, you always want to have it maximize your impact. And so you have to spend a lot of time really determining what is that impact? How do you maximize that and everything? Um, but I think there is something around that, that, um, some charities are just very comfortable staying relatively small because growing is complicated and difficult and not easy. Mm -hmm. um, and I often say, when you're a charity, try to have someone on the board who is that like child in Grimsby, because someone should be sitting there saying, why are you helping us? Um, because I think, um, you know, something should really be pushing charities to get bigger and to even, you know, help more people if what they're doing is successful, basically. Mm -hmm. But it is really hard, you know, you, and I think the other thing we did teach first is we tried to find a funding model that worked, um, with some philanthropy, some government, some fees for services, and you try to balance that funding model. It's definitely gotten more difficult for charities the last few years, mm -hmm. I'd say. Why has it got harder for charities? I mean, government, I think, um, you know, has stopped funding things. I just saw last week they were providing support for Teach Now, which was something that was, it was, it was a bit of a spinoff of Teach First, which was to help um, mid-career um, individuals into teaching. It was started by Lucy Calloway from the FT. And, uh, and I think it was like one and a half million pounds a year. And it was having this amazing impact. Um, it just seemed a no-brainer. And the government just cut that off. Or, I mean, I've seen government make some bad decisions. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think it's just it's a more difficult environment. Just also, you know, as opposed to maybe 10 years ago where it was much more of a growing economy. Mm. Too. You mentioned that education system has got better, uh, particularly in the UK. In what way? I mean, there's lots of people kind of like slamming. It's like, oh, you know, schools mm. are no good. You know, what you're te being taught there. It's like it's not useful for, for the future. In what way do you think the schools have improved? I mean, 
I guess to me in the system, it seems totally self-evident that they've improved. Um, every international ranking, it, I mean, you could pick one, which is PISA, which is which PISA is probably the gold standard ranking, which is done by the OECD. And uh, it looks at um, reading, um, science and maths. And it uses, I, I think, I mean, I've looked at this these tests before and I've spoken to lots of people involved. And I think it's a pretty good like test of reasoning and things. You know, England is now one of the best systems in the world. Well, they're definitely one of the best in Europe in the top 10, you know, on all of those. Um, and, you know, it might not be as good as a Singapore or a South Korea, but it's pretty good. It's like in the in the second tier. You know, it wasn't like that 20 years ago. And as one example, if you want it, you could see Scotland and Wales have dropped while England's risen in those rankings. And I think that that does say something um, just as, as sort of an experiment. I'd say anecdotally, 20 years ago, I visited lots of schools where um, the head teachers were talking about keeping the kids off the street, uh, there was a real lack of discipline. You got the feeling like, you know, a very tiny percentage of kids left the school with any real, um, qualifications or anything. And I think today those schools would have been shut down or they would have had new leadership or things like that. Um, you know, so I think you could, there's a lot of debate about whether the curriculum's correct and I could disagree with a lot of it. Um, I have a child going through GCSE now who's memorizing poems, which seems insane to me. <laughs> and, you know, he hates it. Um, so, you know, I certainly don't agree with everything, every curriculum decision made. But I do think overall, you know, cross-party labor and then the conservatives and, and Lib Dems also, um, mm. as well as a lot of amazing entrepreneurs have over 20 years and lots of great head teachers and teachers ha have moved the system. I mean, I think we could feel positive that, the English education system today is much better than it was in the past mm -hmm. and is pretty good globally. That doesn't mean it'll stay that way going forward because I think the last few years, there's been a real problem with teacher pay. I think there's been a real problem with teacher recruitment. You know, it feels like this current government has sort of lost any energy to continue any any improvements. So I do worry um, things will start to backslide in the, in the next few years unless something happens. Mm. So what must happen? I mean... You need to prioritize teachers overall and, and school leaders. That that's like the most important thing. So, you know, it's one thing people often like fiddling around with systems and big things, but in the end, no school can be better than the quality of the um, head teacher and the teachers who work there. So, and that's what excited me about Teach First and Tiny now. Tiny is basically attracting great talent into low into um, child minding. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to attract and keep great talent in schools. You know, and um, I think. That just has to be the priority. I mean, there is something around pay where I don't think pay, most people don't go to teaching because of pay, but the last few years, um, it, it was up until a few years ago, I think pretty reasonable. I think last few years it's not anymore. And mm -hmm. I think that's a problem. I think there's all sorts of questions around could school be more flexible. People want to work part-time and all sorts of things that other businesses have responded to. Mm -hmm. I think schools have to respond to. Um, there needs to be some creativity. There needs to be a strategy. Like there's no there was a strategy. I don't think there's a strategy now on how do you attract and keep great people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, that that's the center of any great system. I think you probably, well, because you spend so much time in terms of, you know, looking at recruiting and retaining talent, mm -hmm. you are the expert within that. Mm -hmm. What what have you learned through your work at Tiny about retaining talent? I mean, I mean what I've learned is, first of all, you can attract and keep great talent um, through if very, if, if you're all aligned around mission and values and vision. So, I mean, you know, I think often people think it's all about money and things like that. And it's not, um, I think the money and, um, the compensation needs to fit a bar. So that's the hygiene factor. I mean, I worry today it hasn't met, it doesn't meet that hygiene factor anymore. I mean, you need to be able to live a, a okay middle-class lifestyle on that salary. Um, but beyond that, there's a huge proportion of people in this country, top talent, you know, young people, older people, um, very talented individuals who, as long as they meet that bar, want to work somewhere that aligns with their values and life mission. Mm -hmm. And schools can do that very easily, actually. This is where schools have a massive advantage over most businesses or other organizations. Because when you're working for a school, you're a leader for young people. You're, you're changing their lives. You go in and you're, you know, by definition, doing something good every day, um, helping people, um, you know, doing something that actually, you know, can make a massive impact in the lives of 30 or 100 people at any given time, depending on how many classes you're doing. Yeah. So I think this is a major strength that schools have, you know, to attract and keep great people that they need to you know, use more basically. Mm. It's true. I mean, having something that is so 
It's like, it's always, <laughs> you know what it says on the tin in terms of when it comes to schools, because they already about inspiring the next generation and teaching the next generation. So yeah. that completely makes sense. With, you know, putting your entrepreneur hat back on, and when you were looking at the idea of Tiny, what was your process like then? What were you looking for and how did that come about? I mean, I had done Teach First for 15 years. And when we started Teach First, we were just focused on secondary schools. And then very quickly, I thought this was, and people say, what well, was one of your biggest mistakes at Teach First? That was probably one of my biggest mistakes was not early on also working with primary schools. Mm -hmm. um, because I think early on, I thought our secondary schools are where you make the biggest impact, you know, teenagers. And I actually realized, no, it's primary schools have a much bigger impact in the lives of children than secondary schools. And then working with secondary schools, I met with so many of our teachers who were telling me, look, I have these six-year-olds who don't know how to play. I was like, what are you talking about? And I play, and they were showing me like kids who don't know how to um, interact with others, who you know don't really communicate, like very basic stuff. And if they don't know how to play at age six or seven, you know, they're gonna be a few years behind. And you know, being able to do anything in school is gonna be very difficult. And they're probably not gonna catch up by the time they get to secondary school. And it's just gonna continue on through their lives. Mm -hmm. And we know in your first two years, so much of brain development happens. I think you it's the first two years of your life. You, you, you learn more than you learn the rest of your life. So you're not learning stuff then. It's going to be very difficult to catch up. And that got me very excited about early years. And I thought, okay, what's happening in early years to help more kids access outstanding early years um, education? And every country I visited with Teach for All, I saw the same thing where there was a massive shortage of early years care. So this is a global problem. I don't think almost any country in the world has it right where they have enough earlier um, educators. And when I looked into that problem, I started thinking, well, look, we know there's lots of people out there who love working with small kids. Um, like this isn't a job that, you know, people hate. Like it's not, I'm just trying, I don't want to, don't want to pick out any job, but think about what is, what's a job that would you find very boring or you'd hate or, you know, working with small kids is a delightful, fun job. If, mm -hmm. if, if you like working with small kids, mm -hmm. which many people do. I mean, so people, you find it very quickly if it's not for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think it's one or the other. Either, yeah. either you find small kids really not a lot of fun to be around. Yeah. Or you find small kids a huge amount of fun to be around and really enjoyable like working day. So I think it's one or the other. But mm -hmm. but there's definitely a lot of people out there who, with you know, the opportunity to to teach and work with and develop, you know, young children as, as their daily job mm -hmm. is very appealing. So you think, why is there a massive shortage of people doing it? And you get down to it, it's really easy. It's, it's because the pay is absolutely awful. It's literally less than stocking shelves, you know, um, sometimes less than minimum wage. And often the conditions are very bad, um, you know, in nurseries for, for people who do it. So that's just going to be thinking, is there a way to use technology to change that situation where you could allow earlier educators to earn a professional salary? And the first thing I thought is these people need to earn at least what a teacher earns. You know, I think there's no, so how do they earn what a teacher earns or more? And how do they have better... Um, conditions for themselves and more flexible, like modern working environment. So I get very excited about child minders and child minders are, they're different from nannies. They're um, uh, registered licensed individuals who follow the earlier curriculum um, are, um, you know, have to get inspected regularly, have do all the safeguarding, um, you know, and actually, um, but do it from their home basically. So take care of a small number of children in their home are eligible for all the government payment schemes and everything like that. Um, and the number of child minors in England has been dropping, and it's only about 10% the number of France. So France has 200,000 child minders. England has about 25,000 child minders. Wow. And so I started thinking, why are there so few child minders in England, and why are the numbers dropping? And what I got to, I, I spoke to probably about 100 child minders, because to me, I thought this is the answer, because if you're a child minder working with three or four children in your home, it's almost like an Airbnb, you know, versus working for a hotel, like mm -hmm. minimum wage. You're using your home twice, you know, in a different way. Even if you're earning like seven pounds an hour per child, child, that's, you know, 28 pounds an hour, 21 pounds an hour that you're earning from these kids and minus expenses, you're in your house. So, I mean, once you get to over 20 pounds an hour, you're earning, you know, a, a salary similar to a teacher or a professional salary. Um, and what I saw is the reason children numbers are dropping is because it didn't feel like there's anyone responsible for recruiting, supporting, helping child minors. Like I didn't see any organization or business really that put child minors front and center and said, we're all about child minors. You know, we're here to support you. We're here to run your business, um, to help you run your business. 
And talking to lots of child minors, what I saw was there's lots of people out there who are very, very talented at working with small kids, you know, amazing, um, but not at running a business, basically. Yeah. Like, it's a totally different yeah. skill set. Yeah. Like doing their taxes, figuring out contracts, negotiating with parents, um, you know, doing all the paperwork on early years foundation stage curriculum. Like that was one thing where it's a totally different skill set. And then a lot of child minors were also telling me they were feeling very lonely and isolated. And not part of a proper community, um, you know, professional community. So I think those are the things we've been trying to solve with it. And the thought was, could we use technology to solve for that? Could we use technology to help people run their business in a, in a very easy way? You know, just people were very good with kids, but maybe not good at running a business or, or that's not their top skill. And could we use technology to help them feel part of a real active community that's mm -hmm. supporting each other constantly? So, you know, they're working with their kids and, but they're also working with other adults and others. Um, and that, that's what we've been trying to do with time. Mm. I suppose it's a problem with a lot of freelancers, regardless of whatever space. Like if you're, you know, you've been working within a big organization, you're like, you know what, I can just go off and do that by yeah. myself. And then you realize that whilst you're very good at the job itself, all the other stuff, like all of the admin, like really like bogs you down yeah. and you have to be like a jack of all trades and that you're applying that to kind of like the child minder community. What's been your biggest challenge within the business? Um, I mean, COVID was a massive challenge. So, yeah, I mean, for that was sure. Fun. Yeah. Um, so we raised um, a big round in uh, January 2020, and um, and we we're really excited. We hired a bunch of people. Wow, that's like just yeah. before. Mm -hmm. So the good thing is the the money came at the right time. Uh, the bad thing was um, basically we then had about two years where it was very difficult to open child mining settings. And many of our settings had to close where they had, we have these pingdemics, if everyone remembers, which everyone tries to forget, where, you know, if you or one of the kids or one of their parents came in contact with someone with COVID, then they had to shut down the whole setting. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we had two years where, um, you know, I think we all thought it would be a bit of a shorter crisis. We didn't think we'd be going on for two years. Um, if, if we had known it was going to be two years, we probably would have cut our burn a lot more yeah. and, um, and, you know, held back on some stuff. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, we spent we spent a lot of that time building our our tech products, so that's been our main focus. That so we have a very unique um, product to help people run these businesses. But we also tried to grow our child minders, and it was a real failure. Like those two years, we just couldn't because every time we were trying to open child mining settings or helping people open them, they then had this shot a week later. I remember those times because my kids were very small during that period. Yeah. And I think I must have like blocked it out or like phased it out of my memory yeah. because it was just so stressful because, you know, for nurseries, I mean, for them to have, you know, anybody with COVID is like a massive problem because you had to like literally send everybody home. Yeah. And then the uncertainty of, you know, not knowing when that's going to end or, you know, when people can kind of return. That was, and for the parents, like having to have their kids at home working, yeah. I just remember, yeah, like... <laughs> with, you know, like shudders going through my body, what that period of time was like. But I can imagine yeah. when that's like your entire business is is, is around yeah. that. <laughs> I think, you know, a lot of businesses fail during that time. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's only two years ago, a little over mm -hmm. two years ago, but it does feel like, like a, a lifetime. lifetime ago. Yeah. <clears throat> I think people, mm -hmm. it's everyone pushes it out of their heads. Um, but so that was really difficult. I mean, the last two years, you know, have been much better. I mean, obviously the funding environment is constantly changing. So it went from relatively straightforward to raise uh, venture funding mm -hmm. to um, we just raised around uh, a month ago. And I mean, that was a little more difficult because it's a um, very different time period now. For sure. Um, um, and I think I'd probably the other thing that's always difficult is just working with government who, um, you know, I think it's just sometimes very difficult because they um, make these big decisions without really talking to anyone in the sector. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't feel they're fantastic often at working with the mm -hmm. sector or building a sector. So what do you need the governments to do? I mean, what's interesting about earlier is, is it's very um, highly regulated, which is in some ways good. I don't disagree with it because these are small children. I think this is a good thing in England. England, they follow the early years foundation stage framework um, as part of the regulation, which actually globally is considered a very good framework. So I'm very much in favor of that. Safeguarding regulation is outstanding here. Um, so I think there's some excellent things in England that many other countries don't have as high a safeguarding framework and don't have as high um, like a sort of um, education framework um, as we do in England. Mm -hmm. So, and these are some very positive things I'd say. Um, I think on the other regulatory side, um, there's lots of just little regulations that, you know, 
add up without any thought behind them. Mm -hmm. And I think the difficulty is we're regulating our child minors, but we don't get any government support to do that. While um, child minors are with the government, the government pays for it, basically. So that's part of the problem. I think, you know, there's certain things where they make a decision. So they're currently, the government's investing a few million pounds on a big marketing campaign currently to recruit more early years workers. And I said to them before, and I said, look, if you want to attract these people, why don't you just say to us and, you know, some of our sort of competitors like Cora Kids or, or Nannies or others and say, look, um, we'll pay you X amount for everyone you recruit, you know, and then let us use our marketing. We know how to market these people. So, and they would have gotten, they said, pay by delivery. So they didn't do that. And so they're spending millions on this marketing campaign. And all we're seeing is our Google ad search costs are like doubled, you know, and the people who are coming through the marketing event are the wrong people who are not, you know, not really interested in child mining, mm -hmm. being attracted for the wrong reasons or anything. So I think, you know, there's a number of organizations that are experts in this. Um, and, uh, it's just, you know, I think it's it's like difficult working with government sometimes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> How are you different to your competitors, like Cora Kids, for example? Yeah, I mean, so what's interesting is there's not, I'm, I mean, there's not many companies in the space. Like, so I, I think my view is like the more the better because, you know, it's not like a problem where we're all competing against a shrinking market share. Like actually there's incredible need for more earlier care. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we could have, a few different organizations that grow massively and win. Um, you know, Cora Kids focuses on nannies, which is different. We focus on child minders. Um, and I think it's certain child minders, you know, are regulated, um, are eligible for all the government payment schemes, unlike nannies, like are eligible for these new um, uh, 30 free hours um, that the government's giving. Um, they um, have to follow the earliest foundation stage framework and, and all of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a different, like that's in, in child minors, which we're focused on and nannies or, or all pairs. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, there's, what's interesting though in the space is you'd expect to be more entrepreneurial companies in their earlier space. You know, there's only a few, I'd say there's them and Bubble, which focuses on, I think, babysitters and um, I think all pairs and, and also maybe nannies. Um, why do you think there's such a gap? Like, why is this so yeah. few? I mean, I do wonder that, like sometimes, like because it's a massive sector. Um, I think it's a really complicated sector. I mean, mm -hmm. I just say, like, you know, it is not easy. So we've spent five years now building this platform that has been with my two co-founders, um, who are very, very experienced um, CTO and Chief Product Officer, um, Ed, Ed Reed and John Newbold, and their teams. And it is really like every problem we saw, we found another problem, and even. <laughs> how the government is paying in uh, some of these new uh, payments that they're doing through local authorities, which is very complicated. Um, so I think the problem is it's a sector that's very complicated. I think um, it's a sector where you need a lot of adults and there's not a lot of money. So that's the problem. That's why nurses probably pay so little. Um, and I also think there is still this old belief that early years is kind of not sexy. Yeah, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, there's still a belief, you know, people I still don't really tell them just how important early years is. So not only is it important for the kids, but it's important for the parents to get back to work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important for the sector itself because, I mean, there's uh, so many people who work in early years. There's, I think, 200,000 or more more than 200,000 there, people who work in early years in England. And, um, you know, they need a great sector also. So I think it's this massive sector that people underestimate. Mm. Something you said earlier about this kind of like idea of slightly sexist views about how yeah. it's the responsibility of the mother to take care of, you know, children. I mean, looking at any kind of comments around that on social media, like TikTok, it's like, well, you know, you know, it's a woman's responsibility to take care of the kids. And, you know, it, you know, wh why does she even want to go to have a job? And, you know, you know, it's her role to be like with her kids from, you know, the beginning. It's like, it's, it's somehow detrimental to the child to not be with their parents. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, um, so first of all, I think it should be parents, not moms, you know, obviously. Um, and I do think there's some very old sexist things that's still sort of ingrained in society that, um, you know, we don't have to worry about small kids because that's what moms are there for, you mm -hmm. know, which, which seem like they should be very historic. So the first thing obviously it's parent, it should be parents, not moms. Um, I think, you know, everything I've read is what's great for small kids is a combination of care. So, you know, I think first of all, 
every parent has different situations and, you know, children are very resilient. And as long as, you know, they have good quality, safe care, they'll be in good shape. So that might be child minors, that might be nurseries, that might be grandma, that might be grandpa, mm-hmm. that might be parents, you know, but there's a lot, you know, children can do well in lots of different environments. Um, I think what a lot of people say, the ideal is, you know, they spend some time with parents. I think when they're younger, child minders probably are better than nurseries because child minders much more mimic a family environment where right. it's like in a house, it's with only a few other kids who are like kind of have a sibling relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, when they're under three, you know, you don't necessarily want them in an institution type place, um, you know. Um, but also, I think what somebody will say is when, you know, having some time in child minors, some time in nursery, so they get a bit of each is, is a good experience. It's like replicating that kind of village, yeah. you know, environment where you've got more people who are responsible for that child rather than just like one or, you know, two individuals. Right. You know, you've got this set of grandparents, the cousins, the the friends, you know, different age groups. So that the children kind of like absorb all the different right. ways that you can be cared for, but everyone's... It's someone say incentivized, but because they they love the village and the community so much that everybody kind of like pitches in, and I feel like what's what's happening in our world is that you know we're living in smaller and smaller communities right. where a lot of what was provided to us by a community is now a service, mm-hmm. and so in order for it to exist, it needs to have some kind of you know monetary transaction. So we're replicating that, and I think what you're saying like it's just making me think that. We do need those different types of individuals who are, you know, well-educated, who, you know, are aware of what, you know, how to do the yeah. early years properly and uh, and putting the right people with the right skills and knowledge in the right places. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, look, um, early years education is a proper professional skill. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, I think we do need properly trained people to do it. It's not just something anyone could just do without any mm-hmm. training, without any support, you know? I mean, I think you can take care of children, but but to actually ensure that they are educated and, you know, are learning, um, you know, in the right way, I think, I think that is a proper skill. Um, but I also think, you know, there's lots of ways to take care of small children, you know? And I think, you know, it, often it depends on the parents' needs. I mean, the main thing I think is we just need to make sure there's lots of really good high quality care available mm. and, and there should be. Picking up on what you said that it should be a responsibility or well, it's 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 both parents it's uh fathers and mothers what do you think in your opinion as a father yourself mm. that men need the support with in order to be fully involved and i suppose for it not to fall so much on the female partner in the relationship yeah i mean you know sort of it's i guess a cultural change like um one of our um developers on our team is uh, living in Germany. He's German and um, he's having a baby. And, you know, I was just trying to him about his six month paternity leave he has coming. And, yeah. you know, um, where I think what he's doing is him and his wife are each doing, he, she's doing three months and he's doing three months and she's doing three months and he's doing three months. So they're going back and forth, um, which just seems like a great thing for the child, mm. as well as, you know, probably for both their careers and much better than one person taking it. Um, so I, I wonder how much of it is a, a cultural thing that some countries are doing much better and England's maybe not doing quite as well. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. We, we've, we about like four or five percent of our child minors are men. Most are women, and you know, it's forty. Did you say? No, four or five. Like ninety-five percent are women. Yes. Okay. So yeah, men. because I was going to say forty. Yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. nearly like yeah. you know halfway there. Yeah. We really struggle to get enough men. The male child minors we have are amazing, mm-hmm. and they're full up. And you know, I spent time with one recently, and you could see the kids love them, and it's so much fun. And I do wonder what else we can do to even more normalize the fact that you know men are really good with small kids also. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think the best primary schools I see, there's lots of primary schools, usually work really hard to ensure they have quite a lot of men working there as well as women because they usually now like kids kind of need or like get something different sometimes, especially Mm -hmm. like, you know, maybe boys sometimes might get a little something different from having male, um, you know, educators as well as female educators. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, maybe something we could think of as a society like, you know, how do we normalize it even more? Mm-hmm. That you know, how do we normalize it even more? Um, I mean, I do wonder. Some of it is like, you know, this sounds crazy, but like, you know, I think earlier, earlier education should be really professionalized, and I think England is moving that direction in some ways. Like having this earlier foundation in its curriculum, it should be seen as a like a really important profession. Um, and 
you know, as a profession, you know, attracting both genders and all genders, mm-hmm. like in lots of ways. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think there's something from parents too, to be honest. I know um, some parents, you know, really just want a woman to take care of their small yeah. children for any, I don't, you know, all sorts of reasons, I think that they might think. But I mean, I don't know how to educate, like, you know, people, especially who are child minors or nurseries, these are tr- well-trained, safeguarded, ever, you know, wonderful educators. Mm-hmm. And I think I would say to parents also, like, there's advantages that they should be looking for to, you know, have it. It's like a chicken and the egg, isn't it? It's the yeah. same situation in schools. I mean, predominantly, you know, I don't have the stats, but, you know, just paying attention to my own kids' schools and how I've grown up, yeah. is that pre- you know, in, throughout most of, you know, the education system, you know, there are predominantly female teachers until you probably get to maybe, you know, yeah. you know, university. So there is this subconscious just, I was like, well, teachers are just female, you know, or child minders, they're just female. And so, you know, when you grow up and you haven't been in the childcare system yourself, you, it's like, it's just in you and yeah. you think, well, that's just the way it is. And I think, you know, f- for when it comes to making policies, if that's what your belief is, then it's going to be even harder to bring in more kind of like male teachers, male early educate, early years educators. Mm. And it's kind of like this, yeah, catch 22. No, I agree. No, I mean, I've seen some primary schools where you talk to the head teacher and the head teacher has a real strategy around it. Okay. So I would say, the best head teachers like actually think this through. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm just thinking about one school um, where, you know, the head teacher works hard to get teaching assistants, for instance, who are men Mm -hmm. and then helps them become teachers or has, you know, maybe some ex students from the school who are like 18, 19 year old, um, you know, who are in charge of like the sports in the schools or teaching assistants in different ways, but like really works hard to like develop male teachers in their schools. Um, so I think it's like all HR issues, right? You need like any diversity issue. Like sometimes if it's not happening, you need to really work hard and prioritize it. Yeah. As an issue. Yeah, no, for sure. How do you see Tiny developing over the next few years? I mean, currently we're looking to really scale. I mean, so um, the last six months, we've been about half of all new child minors in the country. But I keep on going back to the stat that France has 10x, 10 times as many child minors as England. So I feel like there's so much scaling we can do um, and, you know, support more and more child minors in the country. We're working with this new government um, um, entitlement where the government's putting a lot of money into early years, but there's not really the um, educators available to do it. Like they really focus on growing demand, Mm -hmm. but not the supply. So we're hoping to grow supply and really support our child minors. I mean, we're doing a lot of product development to make it easier for our child minors to work with the government payment schemes and even, you know, improve the support we're giving them even more. Um, we've started to talk like, um, to, uh, people in a few other countries, because I think over time, um, you know, our product and this tiny, um, model could work in many other countries around the world. And I certainly, you know, from my time at teach for all have seen that this is a global issue. Um, but, um, I think, you know, to me, there's no reason like why we can't attract some great people all over the place to, to become child minders and, and, and work in this sort of system. Mm. What well, seems impossible to you now? But should you achieve that will change the course of your business or your life? I mean, nothing ever seems impossible to me, which is probably because um, that's probably my strength and my weakness sometimes. So we started Teach First. I remember saying, no, I want this to be, you know, massive, be the biggest graduate career in the country. And it was, you know, so we Teach First after it became bigger than PricewaterhouseCooper, Deloitte or any any other graduate recruiter. And I certainly think Tiny could do the same. So I, I think what, what seems impossible to many people is... I go back to the fact, why can't we have 100,000 plus child minors in this country? So I've talked to people in government everywhere who, you know, seem to think child mining is just going to keep on having a slow decline. But we had 100,000 child miners in England about 25 years ago. Like I said, there's twice that number in France. There, there's no, there's definitely many more than 100,000 people in England who would be great child miners who would actually love to work from home if they could earn a professional salary and have that flexibility and, you know, help lead small kids and have that support. So I think what seems impossible to many people is could the number of child minors rather than decline, as has been for 25 years, grow and actually, you know, three or four times as many as we have today. Like, and I always use the analogy of Airbnb, like there always were people renting out their house. 
but it wasn't until Airbnb came along and then suddenly the number shot upwards, you know? And if someone said, you know, do we ever think there'll be like 20 times as many people renting out their houses in London? You'd say, no, of course not. No one wants to do that. But it sometimes takes a new initiative or a spark or a new tech to change people's way of working. So, I mean, that's what I'm hoping we can do with childminding. So do you think there is some education around like with, with parents to be working with more childminders? Do you think that's part of the challenge? I mean, a little bit, but actually most parents like childminders. So yeah. our childminders usually can find parents. Um, and, you know, I think, I think it is our time. Like I want, I want parents to have the same sort of experience that have in the nursery when they work with a tiny childminder. So contracts billing, they get weekly reports, like everything you'd expect from a very high nursery using our tech, like they should get from our childminders too. So that should make their lives easy. I think most parents love childminders because it's flexible. It's usually nose to home. They have a lovely relationship with the childminder. It's like a second family, you know, kids love it. Mm -hmm. So um, the main problem is, is supply is finding people to become childminders right. and, and making them realize actually this is a really good job. Yeah. And apart from, you know, providing the, the tech platform and, you know, a, a safe place for the childminders and creating that community, what do you think Tiny does exceptionally well, better than anyone to create that kind of space for childminders? I mean, what I think we do really well is, first of all, we create um, all the support around them. And I think there's some just really complicated things you have to do day to day. Where if you're a childminder, you don't want to spend hours doing all this admin and taxes and contracts and everything, you know, uh, so we try to make that easy. But then I, I feel we built a really exciting community where, you know, we just had a vet where um, about 300 of them are coming together, you know, an in-person event. We do lots of training events online all the time, lots of community events where small groups of them get together with their kids, um, lots of online community things. So, you know, they shouldn't feel lonely. Like they should feel they're an educator, a professional, part of this professional community that's really active and supportive. Mm. How can people find you? What's the best way to reach out? Yeah, I mean, we're just, the website is T-I-N-E-Y, um, um, E-Y for early years, uh, .co. And I mean, that's our website. If people want to, if their parents out there are looking for child binding for their kids, um, you know, go there. You can find child binders. We have, I think now about a thousand, a little over a thousand now all over the country, um, everywhere in England. Uh, we just opened our first one in the Isles of uh, Silly. I don't want to mispronounce it, which is exciting. Um, and I think for people out there who are looking for a new career and, you know, love working with kids, I mean, come check us out. We could help you, you know, start a new career. That's really exciting. Amazing. Well, Brett, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really wonderful speaking with you. And um, yeah, I think what you're doing is so valuable, especially for, you know, I, I kind of want to address parents, but I think particularly women, because I think that early stage of being able to, you know, really you know, have a safe place to have your kids being taken care of, that you can continue being on that journey of, you know, your kind of career progression and for all of the parents up there. So, well, thank you very much and really lovely to meet you. Well, thanks. Nice to meet you too. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. Each week I read some of the reviews that you leave on Apple Podcasts. And this week we have... Jamie W0112. Insightful listen. Maria's guests are interesting and diverse, and the conversations are always very insightful. This has climbed to the top of my list of my favorite work business podcasts, a must listen for leaders and aspiring leaders. Thank you so much, Jamie. Really appreciate all of your reviews and please keep them coming. And if you like these inspiring stories of leaders from all walks of life and want to support our show, the best thing you can do is to follow and subscribe to the show wherever you are listening. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next week.